See, it is not chemistry. Just in, hopefully, you're like, oh, phew, I thought he was going to learn about atoms and stuff. Right, he's talking about numbers and conversions. So today, today is our day. We're going to launch into it. Hopefully, even if you've had this before, like you were a... Yeah, I did old high school chemistry. It's, just, it's nothing. Hopefully, I can show you some things just in a different way. It makes sense. Oh, so, of course, I brought all my toys, and that's good. Then I get paid to play with toys. Sweet deal, right? It's the dream. So, let's do it. Paper is still a little slightly injured, but I can do it. My new one shows up, which has a green laser. That's dangerous. You can like laser people out on the sidewalk. I sometimes get caught up in that. <laughs> If you ever walk in class and you see a green bean showing up on the sidewalk in front of you, just look up in the window, they're trying to <laughs> Something about the length on those green lasers, it's, it's pretty fun. Okay, so here's what we're after. We're, we're going to get the chemistry. Alright, so as we've discussed, you know, I've already given you the periodic table. In fact, pull that out. Have your periodic table out because you might write some notes on it today. That one that you have periodic table one side, you flip it, and there's polyatomic ions. Um, somebody want to remind your classmates? What the mat you need to get down what, what do you need to know on those, both sides of that sheet? Placement. What do you got? Placement. Placement. Formula? Yeah, so, so on this one, you need to kind of know the placement and the names for how many? 36. First 36 at least. And then we'll probably expand up a couple oddballs in here. Like, you know, you guys probably need tin, you probably need lead. I'll give you a couple more, okay? But even my chart right here doesn't have what you need. You're supposed to have the proper written name as well. So practice that so you're familiar. And the hint is many of them will be normal. Like it will just go, oh, Li is lithium. And you're like, oh, that's easy. The weird ones are like Na, because Na is sodium with an S-O-D-I-U-M, and you're like, well, where did that come from? Right? That's a Latin root. So take a minute with those, but also think where they are, because where they are is going to mean everything here in a minute. You'll see that in the next few days, it'll start to come clear that, like, where that is on that table means everything, how the chemistry works. So this is our handbook, like, as a chemist, you know, like, you're a card-carrying chemist, you, like, Literally, my chemistry card has a periodic table on it. If I got it in here, like, there it is. That's it. That's that's American Chemical Society. That's that's thing. There it is, right there. I mean, if you, if you are a chemist, you carry this card at all times. So, it's kind of the basis of how we operate. You'll see why. All right. So, here you go. I'll expand it up a little bit. Forty-seven is important. Because, you know, silver. 50 is going to be a little bit important to you guys. Because of tin. Some people, I think you're doing some tin, some stannous fluoride treatments. That sort of stuff. I want you to know that. And it's a weird one. Because it's S-N for T-I-N. Right? Again, it's kind of Latin root. I got 79. Gold. Because you want a little of that in your life. And, of course, 82 is lead because... Some old school guys will show up in your practice, salt them. Like, oh my gosh, you got lead in there. Gotta get that out. Right? Because that's how it started. I had lead in my mouth. Well, we need to know the placement of those. Yes. Out yep. It's outside of 36. Yeah. And again, the key, and when we say placement, let do this on your own table. If it's not on there, do you see right above? Including hydrogen is considered non metal. And that helps a lot. And it means everything to how things bind, how they act, what they do. That's kind of the key. All right. And there's the polyatomic ions. That's you flip the chart. What of this do we need to know? Formula name and charge. Formula, like NH, and that subscript's important. Don't get 
don't get lazy with that and you'll see today. Here in a few minutes even, I'll show you what that means. The charge, that literally means electrically it has a plus one charge. And then the name. And you have to be careful with this. Because ammonium looks very close to ammonia, which looks very close to amide, which is, these are three totally different things, right? So that's why you gotta be very careful. And I wish I knew a way around not memorizing these, but I don't. Now, I could give the spoiler alert. You probably on most tests have these available to you. I never should tell students that, you know, because then they'll get lazy and not memorize them. If you memorize them, it'll empower you. If you don't, you'll be you'll be okay. down to the table and it'll it'll make it awkward as heck. Okay. And uh, I don't know how how do I explain that? I you know I don't know. Who knows how to drive a stick shift car? Okay, cool. And so you guys that know how to drive it, you, you know if you're talking to your neighbor, like you can talk all day about it. <coughs> but unless she drives a change, she's never getting it. It's true, isn't it? Okay, you get out in the parking lot and rip it up and, and you have the owner of the car going, what the hell are you doing in my car? Tell you done it a few times and then before long it's like, okay, I hear them, I hear I hear the noises of the engine and I feel the way to shift and it makes sense to me. Till then, it's just, you don't get it, right? And especially the famous on a hill, come to the stop and then I gotta start and I gotta clutch and it's like, crap, that's like advanced. Like now, I'm, now I'm really driving a stick shift, right? Yeah, same thing here. There's something about these polytomic ions, if you don't memorize them, they'll show up, they'll bite you all the time. You'll be like, going up the hill trying to start from the stop with the clutch. It'll be awkward as heck. But if you memorize it, it helps you for all sorts of things. And it has to do with visualization. Like when you see the formula and you see this, you go, oh, this is a perchlorate, not chlorine with four oxygens. You just start thinking differently, like it stays together as a unit. And you'll see that as we go. So enough of that commercial. I can only say it so much. And then I become like, a parent trying to nag me, and you're like, I didn't pay you for that, so I'll quit nagging. All right, that's it. Yeah, so no name, structure, and charge. There's two pages of it. It takes a minute. I organize them in case you're wondering why they're not necessarily alphabetical, whatever. I organize them by charge, and then I put them in families. So CLO, CLO4, CLO3, this is, a, this is a, a, an increasing number of oxygens, and I probably should have flip-flopped these. But anyway, the name set, you know, chlorate, chlorite, that sort of thing, though that relationship is very common. Nitrate, nitrite. It's just telling you the nitrates have more oxygens than the nitrite. And if you get used to that pattern, it helps memorize a little bit. So that same nitrite, nitrate is the same property that a sulfate, sulfite follows. The sulfate has more oxygens than sulfite. Charge never changes though. Now when you start walking across this way, I sometimes have put them together in patterns. Here, I'll show you one. Like this. If it was a carbonate, and then you just attach one hydrogen to it, it it's an H plus that you're attaching. So it's a plus one that it got attached. So if I attach a H plus one to it, it would knock this down by one, right? A plus one and two minus would not knock it down. So it went from two minus to one minus, and it's a hydrogen carbonate. So it's very easy naming. Well, this is a carbonate, this is a hydrogen carbonate. This is a sulfite, that's hydrogen bisulfite. It's a, right, it's just, and the charge just knocks down by one. So I put those side by side. Yeah, here's one, phosphate, three minus, hydrogen phosphate, two minus, because I added an H plus, now I added two H pluses and I call it dihydrogen phosphate. See, this naming is actually simple when you kind of think this way across in a pattern. Follow? That's how I organize those a little bit. Okay? That's why it's kind of weird, but you know, same thing. Sulfite, hydrogen sulfite. Interesting, I don't know why, but I have a sulfate. There would also be a hydrogen sulfate if I put that up there. It's okay. Okay, Woo. notation in chemistry, ready? Let's get into this, because I think, to me, this is something we do as chemists, where we see it all the time, we just think that way. 
And then we don't realize it's kind of goofy to a normal person. And they're like, it looks like math, but it's actually not math, and it's kind of messed up. <laughs> so I'm about to show you how it works. So I figured in order to understand how it works, we should just look at something we could understand. All right? Does that sound good? So here it comes. There we go. I rated my together. Right? They're, they're, there's two wheels and an axle on every one of these, but they, they run around like that. They're not pulled apart. Correct? So, oh, these are like the polyatomic kinds. Like, they always stay together as a unit. So if I find a sulfate, it's always a sulfur with four oxygens. If I ever find this, it's like, a, it's like an axle with two wheels. Follow? Now watch this notation, what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to say it's all chemically combined, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I got a wheel and I got an axle, but I actually have how many wheels? Two. And now I don't want to do this, though, because I'm going to save that for something different. I'll show you here in a minute. I want to do this to show that it's chemically combined, so I put it lowercase. Anything lowercase applies to the symbol in front of it. So now, do you understand my notation? Does that make sense? Once I get it proper up here. I have two wheels and one axle, and that's a unit, and that's this. So apparently I got a couple of these. Now, see, now here's where this comes into play. I need to show I have two of them, because I do have two of them. Right? And I don't want to say that they're chemically combined. They're not hooked together at all. They're, I just need to say I have two of them. So I put that number, that's reserved for in front of. Anything in front of applies to everything after. Make sense? Okay. Now I've got a body. I'm, I'm, I'm building a, looks like a car. I got a body. Right? There's my car body. And then I got one cab. That's just, right? Now they're mixed though. They're not all combined. They're not in a car yet, right? I couldn't drive this down the road. They're just mixed. So I literally mix it like this. This plus this plus this. That's where that notation comes in chemistry. Cool? That's, that literally is the notation we use. Okay? So we're going to make the jump to chemicals before long, but I want you to understand nothing different. Nothing different. Okay, you'll see it here in a minute. Now, there's my car. So now it's all chemically combined. So now it's been snapped together, and it's a usable car. Did it? Did it? Got his cab. Yeah. Right? And that, yeah? Make sense? Now I gotta show it together now, right? They're all intimately combined. So what I do is I say, okay, how many wheels and axles are on that thing? Two and four. Two wheel and axle sets, correct? Four wheels, but they're they're not independent. They're like they came as like polyatomic kinds, they came in as a unit. So I gotta show two of them. And I want to show that it's chemically combined, so I'm not going to do this, because that means it's just a mixture. That was like it was originally. So again, I say, hey, if it's chemically combined now, this gets a little tricky, because this stays together, so here's the secret. That's what we do in chemistry. We're trying to say I have two of those sets. What else is in there? Body and a cab, and there you go. Now, for me, I might do it alphabetically, right? You could, this doesn't matter, the order. It's just saying it's all combined, right? So I might do it alphabetically and go, okay, this is going to be B, this is going to be C, right? And then I'm just going to go like this. And there you go. This is one chemical compound, chemically combined. So it doesn't matter where you put the... Yeah, the order of B and CB. Yeah. Correct. Now, let's get to chemistry, chemistry. If I'm ordering atoms, I read it like a book. So I tend to go, if I'm adding a carbon and a nitrogen, I put the, see the carbon reads left to right first, I would put the carbon first. If you do it wrong, though, you won't get shot or nothing weird. Like the chemistry police won't show up. In the, I'm sorry, you're 
for putting your atoms in the wrong order or could you know, I'm going to kick you out of 1009 class. It's not appropriate. Do you have a card for your car? Are you a card-carrying chemist? I'm about to take it away. You know, that kind of thing. That ain't going to happen. If they get trans... And sometimes we do... We, we change the order on purpose because we need to represent something. Okay? But generally speaking, just general rule of thumb, left, right, top, and bottom is the order. So for my little made-up example, I'd say, well, my order is going to just be alphabetical. Good enough? Cool. There we go. Now, watch this notation. Now, part of what, what discriminates between this and this is this is a mixture. We just talked about this. This is stuff we talked about. This is physical properties. Right? You can just add things together and they can be in a mixture. Like salt, sand, solutions. Right? They can be mixed. It takes nothing to separate them. You just run them through the filter. They come back apart, or you you boil off the water and the salt's left behind. That's just a mixture, right? But if they combine chemically, there's a lot more energy involved, right? So when I say there's a chemical bond, and, and then how do we signal that that actually happened? Like in car world, that's different, but in chemistry world, you'd look for color, color temperature, temperature. It's something like condensation. It's close. It's got a fancy word, but you're on the right. Precipitation. It means two liquids mixing. The solid falls out. Remember that weird yellow stuff? And then gas, right? If gas shows up, you'd know this was happening. It takes considerably, considerable amounts of energy, though. Like, I don't just... I, it take more than... We're not talking about boiling water off of salt. We're talking about taking water and just splitting it in half. Lots of energy. Like a hundred times more energy than just boil off water. Make sense? And that's all you need to know for now, not exact numbers of like, it's a lot more if it's a chemical change. Okay? Now, when we start to do that, here, we get this notation where we say everything that's mixed together here, then the arrow is signaling, I am chemically combining it, and then here's the product. So these are called reactants, and these are called products in chemical language. Pretty cool. Now, I didn't get that. See, I broke my own rule. I, just, I don't have this alphabetical. Right? But again, it's not that. that's not quite as massive of a mistake. It's not that big a deal. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm talking about if I... Now we're talking chemicals. Right? I'm making this chemical right here. I'm making this stuff. That's in here. This is the butane. Okay. Remember we were doing. Then I show you that there's gas in here. You can see it if I get in the right position. See it coming off. Yeah. See that little yes. wave back on the back screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the chemical butane coming into the room. You know, and if you put it with oxygen, it ignites and it makes carbon dioxide and water, which is even a lot more of that carbon dioxide and water gas, right? All right. So I'm literally talking about how do I make this stuff. This liquid in here. Okay? I need four carbons, ten hydrogens. Now, if I had four carbons, that's like, that would be like my cookies. <laughs> if you know what carbon looks like, like black carbon, that's how my cookies look when I get done. Like, I get done, they're like black pot. It's like, oh my gosh, it tastes like burn stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's how I make cookies. I always say it's food fit for the gods, a burn sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so four carbons, ten hydrogens, you put them all together, chemically combine them, you make the C4H10, which literally means like this. See how they're all chemically connected? And we're going to work on this notation through this semester where you totally know what this means. Like all the details of how this means it's chemically connected. But we have two ways of notating things. One is this which says there's four carbons and 10 hydrogens, but this loosely gives me no details about how they're chemically connected. It doesn't give me much detail. This gives me more detail about, hey, the carbons are all connected to each other, and for every carbon here on the ends, there's three hydrogens. On this end, there's three hydrogens. Everything in the middle, there's two hydrogens. And this will work out this semester to where you would know this. You'll even know the fancy name for this is butane. 
and you'll know why it's called that. You'll know all sorts of stuff. You know how many electrons are in here, what kind of bonding, you know, genius, chemical geniuses when you So far, so good? But the starting point is this. Does this give you a better feel? Because you may have seen this before and you're like, I didn't know all these details. The details are this goes low, that means you're trying to say this is all connected intimately with chemical bonds. If it goes big, it means, oh, there's more than one of these, and they're just in a mix. They're just like hanging out in a pile. So I mix this, I mix that, I make this. Now it's all chemically bound. It's just like this, you know, hey, I mix this, I mix this, and then it makes real bonds, and it makes something that is unique. Then it's, This is different than the starting material, right? The will and axle does not a car make, right? I wish. That'd be a better price. You know, it'd be like, sweet. hundred bucks. I got myself a car now. You need a lot more, right? Once you put it all together, you got this, and then you're good to go. Make sense? Okay. And now, we've used these words, remember? Atoms, what other word did we use for these? Elements, atoms are elements, right? That's it. all the 36 plus some on the table you're memorizing. Those are the building blocks. Combined to make molecules or compounds. Those are just two terms that get thrown around. Good? In chemical notation, we call these the reactants, and they reacted together to make the products. Those are good words. Those are good part of your vocabulary now, okay? Good stuff. Woo. Now, we're going to get into it. It's cool when you do this, but you're about to learn kind of some of the details of this. Okay, so I'm going to start with this one. Now, for this, you're not good enough with the Oh, now. Okay. This is where polyatomic ions are awesome. Once you have memorized them, once you've committed them to memory, when I see this, I go, ah, that's... That's that. That's like this. It's always stuck in one piece. A sulfate stays together. Is it truly one sulfur and four oxygens? Yes, it is, but it never breaks apart, really. So when I look at it visually, I go, oh, that's not a sulfur and four oxygens. That's a sulfur and four oxygens already chemically combined. And that thing runs around as a single unit called the sulfate. And now when I look on my food labeling, I see mm -mm, sodium sulfate, which you'll see a lot of it. You like, sorry, but you're eating a lot of this sulfate stuff. You with me? Mm -hmm. And you'll now know, oh, sulfate, sulfur, four oxygens together in a polyatomic ion, it has a two minus charge. Aha, that's the goal of why you have to kind of memorize these. Now, with that in mind, if I'm learning to read this right, you guys ready? Let's just, let's walk our way through. Let's do some counting. Now, again, reminder, if this is applied and there's a parenthesis, it means apply it just back to everything in the parentheses. Not back, not back this far, just the thing right in front of it. So that's the only reason to put in parentheses because you have to apply this to both pieces. Okay, now beyond that, if those weren't there, I'd go, oh, this applies to this and that number, which is assumed to be one is applied back to this, and there's how many of irons? One. Okay, so now we're ready. How many irons do I see here? One iron. How many sulfurs? One. 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 I hear, I hear zero, four, one, and three. So let's <laughs> let's walk our way back through. This applies back. So what would you say then? Three. Three. Perfect. I agree. These are in fours, but this three applies to it. So how many is that? Twelve. Cool. Now, the polyatomic ion. Now we're going to practice because you're going to have your sheet flipped over so you can identify. You're not used to it yet. So you look at these. And by the way, in parentheses, you can always assume it's a polyatomic ion. So that's a giveaway for now until you get more comfortable with it. How many polyatomic ions and what's the name of the polyatomic ion? So this is, look on your chart, it's called a sulfate. And how many of those are there? Three. Three. There you go. Perfect. Iron, three sulfur, 12 oxygen. That's a good starting point. When you get, the, we're going to work this skill for a minute. We're going to work this skill. You ready? Get your whiteboards out. Everybody have one? 
It's a good marker. And if you didn't get one, make sure to help yourself. Make sure you put it back when you're done. Make sure you get a good marker. If the marker doesn't work, throw it away. Get a new one. Let me know. I'll replace it. Whatever. Good stuff. Woo! Woo! Look at them all. So we're going to do the same thing. It's too bright. I want you just to say, start with atoms. Just do atoms first. Say, okay. And this is good practice for you. Go MN. I don't know what that is. Manganese, man magnesium, I don't know. I know. You look on your chart and get used to finding it and say, oh, I know what this is. And how many of those are there? Three. Three. Okay. Let's just work this all out. So I want you to do the atoms. Then I want you to turn around. If, if there are polyatomic ions, tell me how many. Anytime I see these, we go, aha, polyatomic ions. But I'm going to warn you ahead of time. This will help you too. You ready for this? Really, in this class and this level, and this level gets you a long way, it's actually. It'll get you, if you were doing it official chemistry, it'd get you some one and can two. This just thing I'm about to say. You ready? Here's another way to identify polyatomic ions. More than one atom, or more than two. So look, no polyatomic ions because there's only two atoms. So it's something carbon bound to oxygen. That makes sense? Even though I don't have parentheses, I see three atoms. So I go, aha, one of those is a polyatomic ion. So either this is grouped together as a polyatomic ion, or this is grouped together as a polyatomic ion. Because there's more than two. Now do you see it? Hint, hint. It's using the second one. So it's actually nitrogen with three oxygens. Go find your, find it on your table before I let you guys lose. What what was that? Nitrate. That's a nitrate. That's a nitrate. Cool. All right. Does that help? Did everybody understand that one, two, three idea? What I'm saying? Or do I need to clarify it one more time? Okay with it? Okay, good. Well, and then if not, flag me down because I'm like, okay, I, did, I was embarrassed to say it, but I didn't understand what you meant by the two, three thing. So that's cool. Let's go to work. And what I'd like for you to do is I'm looking for at proper atom counting and proper polyatomic ion identification and counting. Super strong skill to get you going. How many of you guys picked up just now from what I just said a little different view of like, oh, I finally am starting to get, why do they do this little, little numbers, big numbers, now I'm getting it. Does that help? Yeah, yeah I kind of I kind of so, like that. So that wasn't obvious to me, I, and I taught this a million years. So tienes este, tres de ellos. So este número se aplica a todo, no nomás la N, porque cuando tienes un de glóbulos, este todo es a dos de aquí. So M no tienes más, ¿verdad? Okay. So de ya tienes ese. So sulfate yes. tienes cuatro, porque este se aplica al ectoporfín. Por eso están paréntesis. Yes. ¿Sí que es? No, este se aplica nomás a dos paréntesis. Mm. Mm -hmm. bueno, so, sí, es lo mismo que este, pero este se aplica a pero aquí tienes dos juntos porque tienes uh, so, um, ¿cómo se llama? Okay. Este, no, sulfur y tienes oxígeno. So aquí son dos atoms porque ese no es tan chico. Es la oh. tigre. So this one goes over here. So you have four sulfate, um, sulfurs. Yes. And then oxígeno you have 60 porque este por este. este porque es grande como si este tuviera cuatro. Y luego the S S O es un chart. Este es sulfur y es sulfate. So, poly, polyatomic ions tienes cuatro. Porque este, acuérdate de afuera, se aplica a todo esto. Imagina. Mm. Ok. Yeah. So, SO, it's who trade in there. Yes, SO4, SO3. Más SO5, this one tiene tres nomás. SO5, SO4. SO5, SO3. Ok. okay. okay. I need help.
Oh, yeah, but this is that. That is like that you can hear. This only plugs back to the oxygen. And then the oxygen and that apply to the on that. Yeah, that's for us. That's something to build on later, so you can ignore it for now. Hey, you guys, uh, I, this has come up, and I appreciate it. The sulfite has a two minus above it. Ignore that for now. We have a, We can't delve into that yet. We've got to build a little bit more concepts against us before I tell you what that means. The way these are written, those charges are hidden, so you don't need them. It's no point. You just need to know. Oh, S with three oxygens. That's a sulfite. And that's all you need to know. And how many of them? Looks like about four. That's all you're doing right now. So ignore the charges now, and it will make sense later when I can explain it to you with a little more detail. Not long, though. Either today or, or Wednesday, we'll get it. You'll see what that means. Uh, 
Just one, really? Sí, porque este no cuenta con todo, a lo menos que esté en paréntesis. So N A no más está solo. So you have to watch you get two for or one for N. Oh. Nitrogen is a capitalized. Acuérdate cuando están capitalized son elements diferentes. By itself. Yes. Y tú vas a cuenta que te estás imaginando porque no cuenta que tienes un N aquí abajo. Cuando son capitalized, cuando tienes uno chiquito, es que yeah, okay. uno está aquí. Mm -hmm. Porque es capitalized. Okay. Yeah, so you got to decide which one is it. You're right. You're in between. And how many of them do you have? Good. Except that name based on. Nope, that's fine. That's fine. It's just not what I wrote on the board. Yeah, yeah. You're right, though. The way you've written it is correct. But that's not how I wrote it. Yes. Yeah, so it looks like you're on track. Except, tell me how many of those are there. Yeah. Three. See that? Make sense? This is how you make it. How many of them? I know. Oh, I see it. Okay. And that's that same idea of these, right? The polyatomic ion. Y acuérdate las reglas que dijo Lito que nos explicó, no sé si las escuchas, pero hoy tengo que ver en una de las cosas. So cuando dijo que te das cuenta que es un polyatomic, 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 How many manganese? Three. How many sulfurs? One. How many oxygens? Twelve. Twelve. And then how? And then what do we call this thing? Sulfite with an I. And how many of those are there? Four. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. And I'm just. Oh, I'm wrong. Right. I got this wrong. I missed this. Because that's supposed to be an I in there, correct? So that's wrong. Bad. Bad, Dr. Thompson. All right. Here we go. How many sodiums? One. How many nitrogens? One. one. So now, if I'm trying to, right, if I had to apply more to it, I'd have to parenthesis that. But that's one. That's perfect. How many oxygens? Three. What is this called? Nitrate. Nitrate with the A-T-E. And that's a polyatomic ion. Cool. Now, this is what I said earlier. Are there any polyatomic ions in here? No, because it's just two atoms. So now we're just going to count atoms. How many carbons? How many oxygens? Two. Two. Perfect. This is good old carbon dioxide. This is stuff that's kind of screwing up the greenhouse, right? It's made every time you burn a fuel. So that's why it's so much in the air. Yeah. This one, yeah. Well, because they do like this, they travel as a combined unit. And the only way you would know that is if you started to memorize this table. So then you start to identify. But for you doing this skill, the fact that this, any of these that have polyatomic ions have more than just two atoms. So the presence of that third alerts you, oh, there's a polyatomic ion. Does that make sense? And usually it's the second piece, but here's one. This is a good, this is awesome, because here's your one big fat exception. I don't have three atoms, I have four atoms. So chances are high, and look at that. Chances are high that this is a polyatomic ion and this is a polyatomic ion. Let's see. We'll get there, right? You with me? Okay. Does that does that help what you were asking? Yeah. So here I'm like, oh wait, there's three. That's probably a polyatomic ion. And it's blocked off, so for sure, right? Okay. How many bariums? One. One. You know, this is the mortician's favorite element, right? Barium. Get it? Barium? Uh, barium before they stink. Okay, never mind. Okay, so how many oxygens? Two. How many hydrogens? Two. two. And then this polyatomic ion is called hydroxide, and there's two of these. Right? And heads up, you want to get ahead a little bit. We'll get to the like, middle of this semester, but the presence of this makes that thing basic. This is the nature of something when we say, oh, it's basic or alkaline. It means this is present in there. So, you know, you can make that little side note. We'll get back to it, but it will just help you later. If something's basic in nature, it means hydroxide is present in it. 
And that's, and you're like, gosh, I got a lot of polyatomic ions. Why is that one so special? Well, that's prevalent in nature on this planet. So I didn't get to make the call. I just, right? It's just, a, it's a common thing, even in the biological systems of like, hey, if you're running a little basic pH, that's because this is building up in the bloodstream. And it causes problems. You know, you're supposed to run slightly basic. Your blood's this slightly basic all the time. But too much basic is bad, because then you get a little loopy. You see this around people that have alcoholism. They, they, their blood becomes basic. It's high in ammonia, and then they start getting a little... Now, this is advanced stages. Okay? All right. Here we go. How many nitrogens? Two. Two. Good. How many hydrogens? Eight. Good. You guys are doing good. How many carbons? One. One. How many oxygens? Three. Perfect. Now, this group is called ammonium. Ammonium. It's, a, it's the only positive polyatomic ion you have on the whole sheet. So usually the negative polyatomic ions get written secondly, anyway, in the notation. And so when you get this one up front, it's a giveaway. Like, oh wait, that's that weird ammonium ion. It's very, it is very unique. Okay, and then this thing is carbonate. Very common. This is common in blood systems, common in water systems. It show, carbonates are all over the place. Okay? Kind of how, kind of how the water protects itself from carbonates. That's a long story. I mean, so, oh, sorry. How did I do? Is this correct? Because I've been making some mistakes. That's two ammoniums, one carbonate. Everything all right? How many sodiums? One. Nitrogens? One. Oxygens? Two. And then what is this? Nitrate. That's the nitrite. This is the nasty stuff that if you put it on meats, it will keep them fresh for a long time, but that poisons you. So what they learned early, like in the food processing industry, like, hey, I sprinkle this on my bacon, it never seems to go bad. Or on my ham or whatever, but what we didn't realize at that time is that it then gets into your bloodstream and it starts to kick oxygen off your hemoglobin. It causes trouble. With babies, it'll make them sick. Give them blue baby syndrome. It's nasty. So yeah. Yeah, you go to get lunch, but you want it nitrite free. Just heads up. Like, that's real. That's real. Yeah. For the polyatomic ions, is there, there's no suffix, like, consistency? Like, eight, eight... Yeah, and that's what I was saying. It's a little subtle. I wish it was eight always meant four oxygens. It doesn't. Eight means the most oxygens for that particular polyatomic ion. So in the case of sulfate, sulfur holds four oxygens, but in the case of nitrate, nitrogen holds three oxygens when it's totaled out. But I do know this. If I can get the high one, like I know the eight form, when I go down one to the I, it's one less oxygen, no change in charge. At least I I'm going to say that again slower because she's asking a valid question. Eight's the most oxygenated form, and when I say eight, I'm going down one less oxygen and not changing charge. So point being carbo, you know, uh, sulfate, that's four oxygens, then I know if I go down to eight, it's three oxygens and I didn't change charge. If I say nitrate, three oxygens, then I know the nitrite has one less oxygen. At chlorate, chloride, you'll see that. Same thing, drop in oxygen. The chloride family is the one that shows the most advanced trend, like all of them. I don't know if I have them in here. In... I think your sheet has more detail than this, doesn't it? Does it have the chlorate, perchlorate, and hypochlorite? It has a chlorite, too. Which, uh, yours, does your sheet have a chlorite? Mm -hmm. So. Chlorate, chloride, that drops one oxygen, mm -hmm. right? And then if you keep building, perchlorate means even more, and hypochlorite means even less. So this is kind of, I should have probably messed these orders up a little better. On your chart, I think I got it right. Yeah. Yeah, this is that building family. You can go from hypo all the way up. Hypochlorite's the least. Chlorite is one more oxygen. Chlorate is one more, and then perchlorate is the most. And we, not there's not many per anything's, except for that family. Um. No. 
<laughs> yeah. You ask, is there a pattern, and really, at the end of the day, no, not a real easy, logical one, right? Well, you know that eight goes before, or less than eight. Yeah. But that's so hard. Big, big whoop. Because in a beautiful world, we would have said eight always meant three, and eight always meant two, something like that. Then right. we'd have been like, oh, this is great, but no. Right. Gosh, I wish I knew why that was. I think our old grandfather, great grandfather chemists, they were just, sorry, but they were hard asses. I think they just loved to make things hard. And it sucks. Like, <laughs> just that, it's hard enough as is. It's a hard. It's a hard discipline. Trust me. I've been teaching it forever. It's a hard discipline. They should have just made it easy. Because it's hard enough all by itself without us making it hard. Changing the Latin words, like, oh, that makes me all smarty pants. No, it just makes it hard to figure out what you're doing. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We just walked through this. Good stuff. Got that. Understand. Understand. That. 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 This is your skill set. You guys got it. Feeling good. That's it. That's number one for today. Okay. Number two. Um, so here's a kind of general atomic theory. All matters composed of atoms. This is kind of where we start from. I kind of lined that out already, right? Everything we know of that we call a stuff, it has some combination of these put together. Either by themselves or in some combination. You know, the only thing that doesn't address is things up the spirit. Yeah, that's I'm just trying to say, like, well, what do you mean? What's not of stuff? Well, stuff we might talk about. I'm feeling love. Well, I probably can't put atoms on that, right? Or I feel God moving. I probably can't put atoms on that, right? You understand? But we, if it has matter and mass and stuff involved, you know, uh, there's some form, you know, this is all chemical, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, for example. Make sense? Maybe this, yeah, this got a little bit of, well, no. I was looking for something metal, but anyway, you got the idea. All right, so the atoms of given, el uh, given element differ from the atoms of all other elements, i.e., the atoms in are independent, like iron is unique to carbon. They're totally unique uh, chemical compounds or what's the other word we use uh, molecules. molecules right consist of atoms or elements combined in specific ratios only whole atoms can combine we don't really have like a half a half carbon adding anything make sense chemical reactions change only the way the atoms are combined in compounds you know, in other words, <coughs> iron, sulfite, the only thing it can kick out at the end of the day is iron and sulfur involved. I don't somehow out of nowhere get a nitrogen flying into the products. That's what that's trying to say. And then you may be like, oh, that's kind of obvious. But nuclear chemistry is different. I can start off uranium and just put uranium in a box and walk away from the box and later open it up and it's lead. It's like, what just happened? But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother level. Okay? That's nuclear chemistry, which we don't talk tons about. Maybe a little bit today, but that's probably it. Okay? So here we go. Let's talk about these fundamental parts that make an atom. We have basically three parts that all combine to make every single atom. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? They're the unique atoms or elements. But they themselves are made up of these fundamental atomic particles. Okay? There's the proton. Where is it found? It's found in the nucleus here. Let's just do, this, do some sketching just so you kind of get a sense of this. Okay. Somewhere in the center of every atom, what do I got today? Oh, I got some iron. Okay. Whew. Here's some iron. Okay. So somewhere in the center of this iron, right, there's a set of these protons. And they're in, you know, if I could look at the iron by iron atom, somewhere in the very center there's this positive charge. It's called a proton. Its relative mass is one. In little, these are little bitty, right? They're very, very small. There's, you know, if I needed, um, you know, to measure an, an atom of iron on a scale, like a, just a gram scale, 
I would need to gather up a lot of those irons before it even weigh a gram. Like, you know, this is that number. I'd need to have at least this many before I could even see a gram of that iron. So those fancy mass units for an individual atom are called atomic mass units. So every proton weighs one AMU, one atomic mass unit. That's of no use to me because I don't work that way, right? I don't, I don't even have it. I don't have access to that kind of scale that measures that small. I only measure in grams. That's pretty small. And in fact, this, these fancy scales I have back in here, they, they measure to ten thousandth of a gram. <laughs> Gram's about a paper clip. I can measure a ten thousandth of a gram paper clip on that scale in there. Now with that in mind, what we do, we've learned how to gather up so many atoms that we always talk in this amount. And that number is Avogadro's number or a mole of atoms. So a mole of atoms is enough that I can measure it on a normal scale. So now iron, or you know, this iron has about 56 grams if I gathered up a mole. Hydrogen has about one gram if I gathered up a mole. So now I could, so, so what we do in terms of mass is we say one gram per mole. So if I gathered up a mole of protons, it would weigh one. So that's kind of it. That's the simple part. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So far so good? So relative mass is about one gram for if I had a mole of this stuff. To be continued, we'll get you back to the mole. The charge on it is plus one. Now, I literally am saying the electrical charge. What I mean by that is, I, I'm just trying to find anything in here that's got it, right? Okay, this does really drive my classmates or my fellow teachers crazy. I'll spill these out. I look on this, I got a positive charge. That That is made by protons. That's literally what I mean. The proton is what makes the positive charge on an electrical field. Okay? So that's what's significant about it. It's the identity of mass, source of mass. It's the source of positive charge. I should put that in here in the notes because that's where it comes from. The electron, and so the nucleus sits in the middle of the atom. You know, I was talking about my iron, right? Now, the electrons are out here. They're just running around. They're crazy. They're like flying around in space. They're they, they make the volume of the atom. So this is kind of crazy. If I took that iron atom and I took it, I got enough together I could get just like a, a needle head, like the needle head. And I went to home plate at the Rocky Stadium and I said, okay, here's my needles worth of iron atoms, which is a little less under a mole because, you know, let's just say it's a milligram, right? That's a Right, that's a thousandth of a mole. That's still a lot of atoms. And I, and I set that iron on home plate. The very, the very first electron I ever got to would be out in the cheap seats. Right, up in the, what, what do they call that? The rock pile, that's where it'd be, way up there. Right, so really an atom is mostly empty space. And what makes this space? The electron. Okay, so, and then we'll talk about this a lot. This electron is what makes this. Now, what, what else do we know about it? Charge, about zero. In other words, in our relativity scale, if I gathered up a mole of electrons, it would weigh like 0 0.000059 grams. So it's, it's almost massless. So we just generally say the electrons don't contribute mass to the atom. Unless you're nerdy and you're like, doing nuclear chemistry, then you'll care about the mass of the electron. But otherwise, generally speaking, do you understand what I'm saying? This is the general idea that we can say if a proton weighs one, an electron's pretty much massless. Like if I'm about to get hit by a semi and the guy driving the semi happens to have a notebook open, that's why he wasn't paying attention and he hit me. The weight of that paper did not matter that it hit me. Just like 
in the atom were the proton coming across. That's the mass, just like the electrons, just like that piece of paper in the semi-light. It's insignificant. I don't care it's there. It didn't, didn't change the damages to my body any. Oh my gosh, if you'd have removed the notebook, I would have survived that. I've, you follow? Okay, so it's massless. It is the creation. It is what gives ne negative charge. And, and when I say I've got electricity, I am traveling, electrons are traveling through the wire. Okay? So when I turn something on and it's electrically, you know, fired up, that means electrons are moving through the wire. That's literally what it means. Then we got this last thing called a neutron. It also is in the center. Pretty much has a mass of one. It's chargeless. For some people in nuclear chemistry world, they like to think of it as this. It's a proton tied to an electron together, which is a good model. It's, but it, it goes in the nucleus. It's sitting in here. So sometimes I draw them like this, like tied together plus minus. Because if I took one plus and one minus and combined the charge, it would be how much? Minus one plus one gives you zero. And it's chargeless. A neutron is chargeless. Found in the nucleus, mass is one because it's a proton, electron doesn't matter. Charge is zero. Source of mass, oh, I'm going to do something with this. It is important if you're wondering about something called radioactivity. Okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Woo! Here I go. Show what I'm doing. I'm just tearing things apart. All right. This make sense? So now here's, here's here's their model, but even as I drew it on here, this is it's not to scale. Because if this nucleus is there, like I could barely 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 see it to get to this much of an electron cloud. This would be super super small, super super massive though. So it's all the mass and all the positive charge resides right here. Very little mass, but all the negative charge resides right here, around the atom. So that's the thing. In fact, they're saying, hey, just if you want to know in terms of meters, 10 to the minus, this is how far across the nucleus of an atom is. That's kind of cool, right? Walking away from pins. Oh, yeah, I've got to put the battery back in so somebody needs this. Uh, Matt Thompson. Ever sings apart, walks away, never puts them back again. Look at that. So this is what that's saying. One. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That's how far across in, in meters, that much of a meter is the distance across the nucleus of an atom. It's small. All I know is it's very small. All right? Now, again, symbols used for atoms. Now, this is cool. If I know the protons, I know the atom. It's the giveaway. The protons give you the identity. Now, so this is an important thing I want you to do. Do you see that top number on the periodic table? That's the number of protons. So carbon has six protons. Aha. Oxygen has eight. What is this atom I have up here then? Now these are... What part? part? Yeah. Electrons. Doesn't say anything about the identity. These are? Neutrons. Doesn't say anything about the identity. These are? Protons. How many do you see? Three. Three. So that is? That's lithium. That's the stuff that people are going to world. It's, right, because it's the heart and soul of our batteries, right? And so now the world's electrifying, so it's like, who has the lithium? China's rocking it right now, but they're trying to find it anywhere else. So yeah, because it could be a shortage, because we're building electric cars, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's cool, but we've got to get batteries for these. Right? You with me? All right. So now, some things about this. Three protons, three neutrons. How many electrons? Three. Now, the charge, remember a minute ago we were talking about charges on this? Here's how you can start to do charge. This is the positive, positive three. 
This is the negative, negative three. The overall charge of this thing is zero because it has three protons, three electrons. It's charge zero. Aha. So charge arises from having extra electrons or too little electrons. Now, you might go, well, yeah, but if I change the protons, that would also change the charge. No, because if I change the protons, I change the atom. Now I'm talking about something different. What am I talking about now? I got two protons. What? I'm, that's helium. That's something totally different. So when I have lithium, it will have a charge only because I put more electrons on or I take more electrons off. Oh, okay. You with me? Okay, we're about to build all that today. Okay, so for today, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to teach you nuclear notation. This is for the nuclear chemists. You ready? You guys probably do very little of that, maybe a little. I don't know if you guys sometimes, I know we do it in the food industry. We do it sometimes, I, we even do it in the scales. We take something that's radioactive and we treat things with it. So you guys might expose things to radioactivity because it sterilizes them. I'm not sure. You might use radioactive tracers to watch something going on inside the body. That sometimes happens. I don't know what anybody, anybody in the tech field that's like, yeah, we actually have a radioactive. We pull it out, it's got all these orange labels like, ooh, danger radioactive. Anybody? No? I just check it. Talk to your dentist and just say, do we use anything that's radioactive? I, I don't know. I'm just curious. But, oh yeah, x-rays? Yeah, yeah, you better x-ray the teeth. So yeah, that has some radioactivity associated. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you ready? I'm going to show you nuclear symbols. This is only dealing with... Now, I don't care about the electrons. That's why I kicked them out, because I don't care. Nuclear chemistry only deals with the nucleus. Okay? So the symbol looks like this. You told me this is what element? Lithium. Cool. Then we put a number down here that's redundant. Because what is three? Number of protons. Yeah, but it's lithium. It has to have three. That there's no these have to match. There's no right, it's just being redundant. If I say I have three protons, I got lithium every time. If I say I have lithium, I have three protons. So I'm just like, that's good. Okay, we're being redundant. That's okay. This number up top is the total count of everything in the nucleus. Which is how much? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's what goes up top. Also called the atomic mass because every proton weighs one, every neutron weighs one, so this thing would weigh six. Ah! Follow? Also called the mass number. Good stuff. Now, if I needed to know neutrons, I'd go, well, this is the protons, this is total count, so subtract them, and I would have three neutrons. And that's. Make sense? So that's the symbolism. All right, now, let's take 10 minutes. When we get back, we'll start working with that concept. But basically, I'm just trying to get you used to this. If I know that, that's protons. If I know that, it's the number of neutrons and protons. So if I have this and this, I subtract it. I call it three neutrons. Last point I'm going to make before you go on break is when we talk nuclear chemistry, chemistry we call this lithium-6 as opposed to lithium-5, which would have two neutrons. As opposed to lithium-4, which would have one neutron. See how that works? I can't change protons without changing the element. So anyway, when you get back, we'll work out that detail. But the name, when you hear carbon-14 dating, you're going, ah, carbon-14, that means you have 14 protons and neutrons, 14 total. Okay. So take a break, you get back, we'll work on that a little bit. Bounce around between this notation. There's a naming too. Like I said, this would be called lithium-6. And then just be able to go back and forth and say, hey, it's lithium-6, I can tell you I have protons, neutrons, and electrons, basically. But again, I'm going to warn you, electrons aren't really part of this, officially. I was a nuclear chemist for two years. We didn't really talk about electrons. Academically, they throw it in. They assume that this is tied to electrons, but there's nothing in here that tells me anything about the electrons. The assumption is that the, the 
the molecule is neutrally charged, which would then mean their protons and electrons are equal. That's, that's not stated on here, right? So, now, here's your first application, you ready? If the protons are not equal to the neutrons, then the thing's radioactive. Let me explain radioactivity, just throw it by you a little minute, okay? Radioactivity is this, there's instability in the nucleus and it throws particles out of the nucleus. And those particles, generally speaking, are dangerous to people. So radioactive materials literally have these parts ejecting at speeds that do damage to cells. Now, that could be anything from you drill into a bed of uranium. Like in Colorado, there's a lot of nuclear hotspots. It's natural. It's not like something weird happened. And if you started drinking out of that water, you might get nuclear, you know, the, mat the materials in your water could literally be thrown particles out at you and they would poison you. We'd have radioactive poison. Sometimes we use that for things, like we use it for a probe. Like I might have radioactive iodine and I'll swallow it, like the doctor will make me swallow it, and that way as it travels through my thyroid gland, I can see it. Because the particles are flying out and I can track it as it moves. So that's a different deal. Or I might purposefully, because cancer is very greedy, like I have a normal cell, I have a cancer cell, something feeds into my body, the cancer cell goes, I'm eating that, I'm eating that. So we feed it radioactive food, because it's like, I'm eating that, good, eat it. Damn you, you're out. <laughs> that's, the, that's how they do radio, like chemotherapy, that's exactly one of the principles behind it when you do a radioactive form. So anyway, with that in mind, that's all I can say about radioactivity, to just kind of give you a sense of it right now. It's a lot more detailed and there's a lot more to study, but we'll just kind of give you an overview. Sometimes we take the radioactive particles and use them to sterilize. We don't actually put radioactive materials on the food, for example. We take radioactive materials, space it away from the food, and the particles fly out and destroy any bacteria on the food. So I might have a potato that's been exposed to radioactivity. The potato's not radioactive. It's just everything that was on it gets blasted by those particles, and it's a way to sterilize. So, and even in surgery, like dental surgery, they might just put all the tools in a chamber like that and just, it's sterile, all right? Smoke, smoke detectors, same. They literally have a little span where a radioactive particles flying over the detector. That gets interrupted with smoke, it'll block the radioactive particle and it goes, oh wow, alarm turns on. All right, so that's called lithium-6, all right? So this is just a rule of thumb. If you know protons and neutrons are equal, it's stable. If you know protons are not equal to neutrons, it may be radioactive. That's just one application. All right, here we go. Shall we try this one? I know this is a symbol, but let's see it. I sorted them, neutrons on this side, protons on that. What do you see? How many protons? Six. So let's go to the table. What is that? You're on the right track. It's that C. What is the C? Carbon. Carbon. So that's carbon. So let's do the symbol for it. Let's see it on your chart, on your whiteboard. So far we know this. What number goes here? Six. All right? What's the top number based on what you see? Okay. So, show me what that symbol would look like now. I'm seeing one, that looks right. Yep, yep. What would you call that thing? What would the name be? Carbon 14. Carbon 14. And you might have heard this carbon 14 dating. Have you guys heard that term? Has anybody heard about carbon 14 dating? Oh, oh, you haven't heard of that? Like if you're a nerd and, you know, instead of like, you know, one of those dating, no, it's not that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to figure out if, if living materials die, you can figure out how old they are, if they're thousands of years old, by carbon-14 dating. Okay? And I, if you ever were curious, you could drop by and I could explain that out in detail. But it's like a fossil. How old is it? You could do carbon-14 dating. Okay? 
The amount of carbon-14 present tells you how long it's been dead. So, that all makes sense? Cool. How many neutrons would this have then? Just based on this, if I just saw this, what would I do? Subtract, Subtract and I'd get the number eight. eight. So that's, hey, is it radioactive? Yeah. Yeah. Sure is. That and that are not the same, and that's true. Carbon-14 gives off a radioactive signal. Which, by the way, if I analyze that fossil, I can use a, 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 a machine that measures the radioactivity to say how much carbon-14 is in there. Cool. All right. Make sense? All right. Which means part of, that's my point, parts of it are flying out of the nucleus. By the way, this is the way it decays. It goes like this. Ping! It shoots an electron out of the center, and that electron is kind of dangerous. Like if you're hanging out around it, you get a sunburn. And if you hung out long, long enough, you'd die. Too much of it. Now, who can name what this is now? Now, this is the weird thing. This is why this is not like normal chemistry, because atoms turned into other atoms. This just turned into another atom. What is it? Nitrogen. nitrogen. What is the number of the nitrogen? Let's get all the numbers. It's nitrogen. Put it on your board. I'll let you finish it. Yes. And the name of it? Yeah. Cool. I'm seeing things. Yeah, this is right. If I... Yes. Next question. Is this new stuff radioactive? No. No. It's just kind of the story. I almost want to tell this story because it's kind of interesting. So as we are right now, there's a small percentage of carbon-14 that's just normal. Carbon doesn't all come in carbon-12 form, which is a stable form. Six, six protons, six neutrons, that'd be carbon-12. That's the stable form. There's a very, very small percentage of carbon-14 in us all right now. Okay? Here, I'll get that off. Sorry. You with me? When I die, I go to the funeral, <laughs> whatever, right? Then what happens is I start decaying and turn into nitrogen-14, which is stable and stops decaying. So the length that I've been dead tells me because it decays at a certain rate. So the decay rate would indicate how long I've been dead. That's how the carbon-14 dating works. So you basically sample a body and go, oh, I know. And you go, oh, this has this proportion of nitrogen to carbon, so therefore it's been decaying this long. Be useless to me in the first month, because that, that plus or minus on that is not close enough. But if you found me thousands of years from now, it would indicate how long it been dead that way. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's kind of neat. Not radioactive. And we call that nitrogen-14. Cool. Nitrogen-14 is stable. All right. I got, here's the kind of things I could ask. I might give you this and I want you to go, okay, give me my symbol and my name. Or I might say, hey, if I knew this, could I fill this in? Protons, neutrons, a common name, and is it radioactive? Let's do these two things. And that's pretty much that skill set. have you three back there you get this first one tell me what that is like what's the symbol is it radioactive okay and then you four on that end I'm gonna have you guys fill this in for me tell me what number should be there I mean we're all gonna do it I just these are the ones I'm gonna ask about so we kind of know what we're doing
One, two, three, four, five. Huh, okay. Five protons. What is five protons? Boron, right? Cool. And it's funny when I ask people about my lecture, a lot of times I hear that, boron. It's like, oh, I think they're saying boron. What do you say? I don't know. Anyway, so anyway, boron, that's the five on the bottom. What number should be on top? Twelve. That's all the count comes out to twelve, correct? And then what are you going to call it? Four on twelve. And then is it radioactive based on your stuff? Yeah, why? Yeah, it's not balanced, so it should be radioactive. Good. Hey, a little side note. How much would this stuff weigh in grams per mole? It would weigh 12 grams for every mole. Boom. Cool. All right. You guys know a lot about this stuff. Nice. Oh, 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 sorry. You guys ready on that end? How many protons in here? Nine. How many neutrons? Nine. Uh, what's the common name? Fluorine. 18. Cool. Is it radioactive? Yes or no? No, okay, good. All right, cool, very good. Hey, how much does this stuff weigh, by the way, in grams per mole? 18. 18 grams per mole. Cool. All make sense? Now, let's talk about that weight for a second. You just said fluorine 18 weighs about 18, but if you look up here, by the way, if you look off the periodic table, and you got one in your hand so it's easier to look, the bottom number's not exactly 18, is it? You know, and in fact, boron 10, you agree with this? Five protons, five neutrons, should be 10 AMUs or 10 grams per mole, right? But I look up here, it's not exactly 10, is it? It's actually more like 11. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is, as I find boron, it comes in a mixture of naturally occurring isotopes. And apparently, there's a little bit more 11 than there is 10, for example. So I can read this number and go, oh, oh, this weighs a little bit more to the boron 11 side than the boron 10. So now, the table, the way the table is developed is, if I go scooping boron all over the planet, from natural sites, not like Japan where they had a radioactive meltdown, like normal sites, I'll find boron predominantly with a little bit more 11 and 10. So this would be the common weight of a mole of that stuff. So if I pull up 10.81 grams of boron, I have exactly one mole. So just keep in mind that these numbers are natural mixtures of isotopes. Not always in one or two forms, it could be three to four forms. Can't that make a difference in the yeah, so generally, boron, as it's found, tends to be radioactive. Right, but, but if it's getting more towards turn, it's Yeah. Or should you always... Just no, you're correct. So if it was leaning more towards the tin form, that would be stable, which is normal. 9 and 9 is 18. Whoops, that one's a little radio. Here we go, 8 and 8 is 16. Mm -hmm. 7 and 7 is 14. That's the common thing. Most of them are stable. But some of them are found predominantly with a little bit of a radioactive a weight towards the radioactive isotope. Now it might be slight percentages, but they're higher. So here's the other catch. It's not always just two. It's not always in twos, by the way. So fluorine might have a variety of isotopes, and some of them are very heavy. So instead of fluorine 19, I might have a fluorine 21, but a small percentage of it, but it weighs the whole thing up to 19. Now, in this class, what do we do with that information? We just know this. This is how much one mole of it would weigh if I found it anywhere normally occurring. So I can use these numbers to figure out how much of this I'm weighing out. And the other thing is, they usually come in mixtures of isotopes. Some of them don't, though. They're pure ions. I mean, pure isotopes. This, right? This is, there's no question about this one. There's no imprecision to it. It comes as exactly 270. Now, these are man-made, and that's why they're so precise. 
But the ones that have the digits on them, those are where you probably have a mixture of isotopes. But it's commonly found that way. Follow? Now, this would be indicative. Like, people, you know, weird stuff happens. Like, you know, at one point we're going on to different com countries and saying, hey, we think you're doing nuclear testing, blah, blah, blah. You know, now you kind of have a clue how they might do that. They might test, test the ground sample and go, you're leaning a little high in uranium weight. Like, that means something's going on here that's not natural. <laughs> Make sense? So that's kind of interesting. Now here's how it's actually calculated. It looks fancy, but I'm just going to show you how, just in case you were wondering how it's done. I'm not going to ask you to do these calculations, but just, it's just like your grade, by the way. You take three tests. I take the average of those three, and they're, they're averaged together. They're, they're weighted. It's the same thing here. If I have 20% boron 10 and 80% boron 11, then I would go, okay, the 10 AMU times the 20% gives you that. The 11 AMU times the 80%, and if I add those together, I'm going to get a 10.8. That's how they do it. So, does that make sense? 20% more on 10, 80% more on 11. I just multiply that together and add these. That would be the true weighted average. Okay? So for example, you do four exams. The first one you get an 80%. I go 80% times 20, right? I go 0.8 times 25%. That'll get, that's part of your overall test score. Second test, 90%. Still 25% of the test score. So 90.9 times 25% gives you the amount that adds to your overall score. I'm doing the same thing here. It's called a weighted average. Just so you know. But for this class, all you have to do is go, hey, here's what I know. I, you know, and you, you, I'm sorry, what is your name, by the way? Stacy. Stacy, thank you for pointing this out. You can kind of look on the table and kind of get a sense by saying, wow, bromine kind of, you know, 35 and 35 should be about 60, 70. It's a high weight, right? It's way off from being balanced, right? That makes sense? Now, I gave you guys a rule of thumb about the protons and neutrons, by the way. Um, that works 1 through 18. When you get above 18, the rules change a little bit. If you really want to do this, and, I, and that's all I'm going to ask you. That's it. What I showed you, I just want you to leave that. That's good enough. But if you want to go on in this, there's another trick. When you get to this weight, the stable form usually is this isotope. So the stable form of palladium is 106. So as the atoms get bigger and bigger, more neutrons than uh, protons is common to a stable form. So we don't, we don't get into that right here, but that's how you would do it. All right, so we got this. Wow, I was talking and rolling backwards, wasn't I? The whole time? Yeah, I do that a lot. Cool. All right. I got all the way through my slideshow and it turned on. Cool. Okay. Now, based on what I just explained to you, this is actually called the atomic mass. It is the mass in grams of one mole, which is a set amount of that substance. This is the number of protons, and that correlates with that. Now, what is a mole? I'll just introduce it now. Here's how many is a mole. A mole is an animal, don't you see? 6.02 times 10 to the 23. It's just a way to memorize this. This is how much a mole of anything is. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So we'll use that number. So I do want you to kind of work on that so you now know what a mole is. It's a lot. But 6.02 times 10 to the 23. This is also called Avogadro's number. So that's one piece of that. We'll, we'll revisit this maybe a few times this, here at the beginning, this first unit. Now, 
with that in mind, I can start to the thing we just learned, right? This is a hydrogen atom. How many hydrogens make hydrogen? Two. So hydrogen bonds to hydrogen and it floats around as an H2 molecule. Now if I took two of those and I combine it with one O2, I could make two waters. Aha. And every water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. You with me? Now the moles come into play because I could say two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen makes two moles of water. That's where the moles come in. Now it might feel more comforting to you to say two of these molecules, like literally two, and one mole of O would combine to make two actual water molecules. And that's great, but I can't do anything with that on a scale. Like I can't weigh that out. But if I do two moles, I could weigh it because I could use the atomic weight up there to figure it out. That's where this weight thing comes into play and why we work in moles. Okay? So, we'll revisit that. But I'm gonna just talk about this about charge. Just wanna remind you something about charge. Negative things repel, positive things attract. Right, so like charges attract, opposites of repel. So when you start looking at this charge thing where you've lost or gained electrons, if they have a same negative charge, they don't like each other. If they have opposite charges, they'll actually attract. So that's one of the kind of reminders about this. So now we're gonna start talking about charge. You ready? Now we're jumping out of nuclear chemistry. You've already done it. This thing, I go in there and I go, okay, this is lithium-6, right? That's fine. Now we're going to talk about how you get to a charged ion, what we call it. Okay, you ready? Now you, you can kind of ignore new, neutrons for this. I don't care about neutrons for this. So I can just focus on protons and electrons when it comes to charge. Doesn't mean they're not there, I just don't need them for what I'm about to do. You ready? How many protons do you see? How many electrons? Three. So the net charge is? Six. Zero. Zero, because that canceled that, right? Does that make sense? The charge goes to the right and top. That is a lithium zero, and the term we use is ion. Ion is a charged particle. Okay, now watch. Everybody okay, lithium zero? Now what is the charge? plus one. Three plus, two minus. Now you might go, hey, I could have got there a different way, right? I might have gone, hey, wait, what if I, what if I put an extra plus in here? Wouldn't that also make a plus one? And you're like, wait a second, that would change the atom. So the truth of the matter is I never change protons. That's a nuclear event. It's very uncommon. I can move electrons on and off things easy though. Here's how easy. If you go on carpet, right, or even on a shirt, right? You saw me do this with a, with a balloon the other day, right? You just, it'll charge that thing right up, right? That's moving electrons. That's how easy it is. Very easy to move electrons on and off. I can't, though, except for like nuclear explosions, start changing protons. Not very common at all. And why? Because they're, they're, they're tucked way in the interior of the matter. Electrons are hanging way out here on the edge, so they're very vulnerable. Right? Okay. So once you get used to that thinking like, okay, if I'm charging up an atom, it's because I lost or gained electrons. That's all I think of. If I... Remove an electron, the thing's going to become more positive. Starting at zero, I remove electrons, I'm becoming more positive. If I'm gaining electrons, I'm becoming more negative. That's the secret to this. Here we go. What's the charge on this? Negative one. Negative one. Make sense? So now you can look at your polyatomic ions and go, aha! I've got ammonium plus one. That means between those nitrogen and four hydrogens, I lost an electron and made it a plus one charge. If I see a minus one on something like hydroxide, that meant 
amongst all of its protons and electrons, it sucked in an extra electron that made it a minus one charge. That's what that means. All right? You guys agree with this? What, what's the element? Four protons. Beryllium. Okay, this is beryllium. Cool. Up. Oh, what's the charge now? Positive one. And that would go where? Over here or to the right? To the right. To the right and up, it'd be one plus charge. Oh, now what is it? Positive two. Is it negative two? How many? Positive two, right? Yeah. Plus four, minus two, uh, plus two. You with me? These are called ions. When I've gained and lost electrons, we call it ions. If I've gained or lost neutrons, I call it isotopes. So two terms, you ready? Nuclear world, you're gaining and losing electrons, carbon 14, carbon 12, right? I'm just changing neutrons, isotopes. Electronic world, which is, by the way, most of this chemistry through the rest of the semester. That's it for nuclear chemistry, what I just told you. Ions, these are called ions. And there's, we might even discriminate between types of ions. The positive ones, we call them cations. See the positive? The negative ones, we call them anions. Here's how I remind myself. Negative anions, positive cations. Yeah. They're both subcategory of ions in general. Okay? By the way, human body, this is where our charge comes from. Like we have electrical charge in us, nerve impulses, how we read light, all that stuff that we do, the electrical stuff, muscle contraction, all done with ions. That's where the charge comes from. That's how we have electricity in our bodies. Right? Checking my heart, put an EKG, it's reading electrical signals. Where'd that come from? Ions in my body. Okay? <coughs> So, I on the electron. I'm just trying to get you stuck in your head. I'm changing electrons, I'm talking ions, right? Let's do this symbol. Oh my gosh, it's got a lot of parts. How many protons? Seven. Seven, what is this element? Nitrogen. How many electrons? Ten. What's the net charge? Negative three. It's a nitrogen ion. Ah. Now sometimes we call those ions, We, if we're taking the element, we want to change the ion name, we go IDE, so we call it nitride. Not nitrate, not nitrite, nitride. I know. <laughs> I know. Not simple. You did? Yeah, right? We should talk to our great great grandpa. Yeah. Dude, my chemistry simple. Cool. Okay, you ready? Let's see if we can do some of this. Let's see if we can walk it out and go, okay, I know it's a calcium. I know it's two plus, so could I fill this in? How am I going to get started? How what could I definitely find based on this symbol right here? Perfect. With a periodic table, assuming you have a table. Okay. Now you guys help me walk through this. You got you, you got me going. So calcium, how many protons specifically? Look at your table. Twenty. Everybody agree? Yeah. Cool. So that's twenty positive. Twenty positive minus how many would give me a two plus? Eighteen. That's how many electrons. See how we did that? Uh -huh. Okay, now here's yours. Let's see what you come up with. Think about that. I'm going to let you do these next three. Or, yeah, three lines on your table. See if you can fill it in based on what you see. Can I fill in the other parts?
Anybody needs to see it. Yeah. See it. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's like you're on track. Good. Yes. Okay. Because you're two. Yeah, negative two. Por eso compré esto. Por eso compré esto. You guys ready? Agree with this? Okay, now oxygen locks this down at what, how many protons? Eight. And then if I'm going to have two minus, I'm going to have more electrons and protons, right? Make sense? This gives away the element. What is it? Magnesium. And that's good to practice saying it, because magnesium and manganese sound very similar. You've got to see the difference in symbols. Okay? More protons, right? Good. Make sense? Cool. That's the skill set. Now you have the two symbol set. Now, by the way, this rolls it all together. It's like it lets you do the whole thing. I'm going to let you use this for just quiz practice. It used both skill sets, but I got to warn you ahead of time. As a nuclear chemist, this is like, this is screwed up. But just what they assume is when you say oxygen 18, the number of electrons is assumed to be the same as protons. And that's, that literally is assuming because we know that's not true. Oxygen could have different charges. But let's just assume, that's why I said it, right? Assume all these are neutral unless I say differently. Now I'll let you practice I'm going to run by this because I'm going to let you save this. You can download these on, write as PowerPoint, you can practice, you get comfortable, then you can fill it in and you get all your answers and feel confident with what you're doing. Okay, I just want to get through this because we've got just a minute left. I just want to show you something. Location on the chart shows the charge they prefer to take. So get out your periodic table because I'm going to show you this real powerful. If you're in row, row one, see it? These, now first off, metals tend to go positive. They're losers, they're wimps. So they want to go positive, they want to lose electrons. Non-metals are very greedy, so they grab electrons, they become negative charges. If you're in this first row, you tend to take a positive one charge. The ion of preference for all that family, plus one. I have preference for the second row, plus two. Super easy. Not a reliable trend that you can use, so I'm not going to teach it to you. It would be of no use. Aluminum's unique. It tends to go plus three. And then the rest, now I should have filled this all in, but it would say anything in this family is minus three, minus two, minus one. So now I can go, chlorine likes to go minus one just by its location on the table. Oxygen is minus two. Do you see it on the table? Minus one, chlorine family. I don't have my laser, it's still help. Minus one, minus two, minus three, just a little bit of plus three, and then all the way over here, plus two, plus one. It really, that will help you tremendously for stuff you do in this class. These are uncertain, so we don't talk about it. That's very good. Those are called transition modes, but. All right, we're out of here.